Hello and welcome to the first EFF Awards. Uh, my name is Aaron Chu. I am uh, EFF's uh, Director of Member Engagement. Um, tonight, it's really wonderful to see all of your faces here. Um, we're here to uh, celebrate the movement for digital privacy and free expression. Um, before we get started, I wanted to say thanks to our sponsors for today. Um, that's uh, Dropbox, Electric Capital, No Starch Press, Ritter Costa, Johnstone LLP, and Ron Reed, of course. Um, I also want to thank the 33,000, oh, yes, yes, please. <laughs> Um, I also want to thank the 33,000 EFF members around the world who make this program and all of our work possible every day. So thank you to them. Let, let's give a round of applause to the EFF members. Please. So I've got a couple of notes of housekeeping before we get started in earnest. Um, please uh, silence your mobile devices if you have not done so. Yes. And uh, for those of us uh, watching this online, um, you're welcome to congratulate our honorees via Twitch chat at eff.org slash livestream. Actually, if you're in the room and just want to get on Twitch and like talk about this event, you can do that right now. Um, and uh, my friend Christian will be uh, in chat, keeping y'all company. Um, so also, if you're an EFF Privacy Badger user um, at uh, our live stream page, uh, make sure to give Twitch chat your permission by shifting the slider and reloading that page. Thanks for doing your job, privacy manager. Um, so uh, we take your comfort and safety very seriously. So um, you can find a copy of our event guidelines and code of conduct at eff.org slash event expectations. Um, if you have questions or need any assistance tonight, um, you can get in touch with one of our designated event monitors. Uh, that's Lee Walker. Hello, Lee. Thank you, Lee. Patrick Lee there. And uh, Rebecca Jeschke. Rebecca. Hello, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Um, if, you, if you need anything, feel free to reach out to them or any of the EFF staff. Um, so we're in a little mean tag with us. Um, for those of us joining remotely, uh, you can drop a note in chat or uh, send a message to events at EFF.org if you have any questions or need any help. So this is a very special night for EFF. Um, we haven't gathered like this since 2019. Um, a lot has changed, as we all know, um, and it's hard to know what's on the horizon. But um, honestly, I'm touched to see so many people here in support of digital privacy and free expression in person. So thank you so much for being here. Um, that deserves a break. It does. So, so to start off our ceremony, um, I'd like to introduce Cindy Cohen. Um, Cindy's been our executive director since 2015. Prior to that, she was our legal director. Um, at that time, you know, she was covering everything from computer hacking, the rise of e-books, um, NSA spying, and like literally everything in between. It's just a crazy amount of stuff to, like, to actually like, write down and think about. Um, she's received so many accolades, including the Vanguard Award from, <laughs> from the Intellectual Property Section of the California State Bar. She was named one of the 50 most influential women lawyers in America by the National Law Journal. And she was one of the Forbes top 50 women in tech. Is that not awesome having people like this on our side? Please give a warm welcome to Ms. Cindy Cohen. I didn't know he was going to do that. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, I am proud to be here as the executive director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm overjoyed to see your faces in person and also want to warmly welcome the folks who are visiting with us on the live stream. Um, this has been an important celebration of the many victories and heroic moments in the digital rights community for the past 30 years. And you, you will hear tonight, we are lifting up some very special honorees again this year. Um, this year's ceremony, of course, is also more special because we're all here in person right now. But we also actually have the best of both worlds. EFF wasn't really able to live stream this event for many years, and now we're, we're doing both. Um, so um, thank you, COVID. Um, uh, as I said, EFF has gathered people together to uh, recognize the leaders on the electronic frontier uh, for 30 years now. It's a long time. 
Um, and um, the internet owes an eternal debt of gratitude to the dazzling constellation of past honorees, some of whom are with us here tonight. So thank you for coming back out again. Um, we've honored cryptography pioneers with Diffie and Martin Hellman. We honored Spectrum Hopper, Henny Lamar. We uh, honored our friend, technologist, and open access advocate, Eric Schwartz. Um, we honor digital rights advocates, Malki Asiro, uh, Martin Malki Adevich, uh, cyberpunk author, William Gibson, privacy protecting heroes of our friends at the Tor Project, and the whistleblower, Chelsea Manning, just to name a few. We saw some of the pictures um, from past awards as we were getting ready here. Um, tonight, we're marking a new phase in these annual celebrations. Um, we started with the pioneer metaphor at a time when the image made a kind of sense for some of the things that were happening online. Um, but regardless of what it might have felt like in the 1990s, it really no longer fits. Um, the internet, thank you, the internet, the internet is no longer anything like a new place. Um, the born digital generation is now in its 40s. Um, there's no longer a sharp line between digital rights and well rights. Um, and if, if there ever was, and the people who need those rights um, are much more numerous, much more diverse, and facing the kinds of problems that exist in a more mature environment than, um, than we were facing in the 1990s. Um, there's a lot of ways in which that wasn't the best metaphor and we're letting it go. Um, the digital world is now plainly still a place where we can dream and develop and try out new ideas, but it's also a place where we are increasingly surveilled, silenced, and disempowered, and where people of color and those who are already marginalized suffer the most. We just aren't pioneers anymore, friends. We are technology creators and users building a digital future together and facing down powerful forces of repression, both corporate and governmental. So we knew we needed a refresh, and it raised a couple questions. You know, first, you know, should we be celebrating the people who, who help us advance freedom online? Yeah, that's easy. Yes, of course we should always. Um, but we decided to shift the focus from who people are to what they've done. And, um, and to more clearly center and name the benefits that they have given to all the rest of us. So you'll hear that each of our award winners was awarded for something um, and not merely for, um, for being a person. Um, the second thing, you know, should we step back from the problems of our time at all right now? It's a very dark time for many in our world and um, expressly recognize kind of the, the blossoms that we see out there in the world. And I think the answer again to that is absolutely. Um, but maybe better recognize that no flower blooms alone. Um, EFF has long awarded the, uh, given the award to groups of people, but I think with the EFF awards, we, we more, it, it's easier to do that. It doesn't feel like the exception. It feels more like the rule. Um, so these insights and others are how we arrived at calling this the EFF Award Celebration, uh, where we celebrate people, but also what they do, um, and where we continue to make space for winners who are not individuals, but instead are communities, organizations, and other group efforts. Um, so this year, I'm very happy that our awardees are Allah Abdel Fattah, who's winning the EFF Award for Democratic Reform Advocacy. <laughs> the Digital Defense Fund, who's winning the EFF Award for Civil Rights Technology. <laughs> and Kyle Williams, who's winning the EFF Award for Right to Repair Advocacy. <laughs> now, we're all we're all here and we all support EFF because we know that our choices will determine whether con technology continues to reinforce old world dynamics that trample the powerless or if tech will support freedom, justice, and innovation for all the people of the world. And we're here tonight because we're putting our marker down on the freedom side. Now, if you will indulge me a bit, I do want to um, brag a bit, talk a bit about some of the work that we've done since last year's Pioneer Awards. Um, 
First, EFF has long railed against online tracking mechanisms, the predatory industry that has grown up around them and the mass surveillance they have fostered. Recently, we published a new series of deep dives into those farms and released the results of a years-long investigation into a company called Bob Data Sciences, a company that buys application data from hundreds of millions of US devices and maps them for the police, often without a warrant. The team uncovered at least 18 local, state, and federal law enforcement clients. The investigation has yielded a tremendous amount of media coverage and led congressional members to ask the Federal Trade Commission to investigate these data handling practices. Your information shouldn't be for sale, and cops shouldn't be able to use data brokers to sidestep our privacy laws. <laughs> We also recognize that privacy and security issues that we have long advocated for were going to be given a new urgency when the U.S. Supreme Court overturned federal protections for reproductive rights. In partnership with groups on the front lines, we went to work adapting our digital security guidelines for people seeking, helping, or offering abortion services. We pushed companies and policymakers, both in the private and the public sectors, to enact changes to support user safety and privacy. And we celebrated when California heeded the calls from a broad network of local rights advocates and passed two bills to protect users of digital services. That fight's not over. None of our fights really are over. Um, but we, we jumped into the fray and we've seen at least some good change as a result. And last but not least, we and many other advocates have continued to work to preserve free speech online under incredibly challenging circumstances. As one of EFF's founders, John Gilmore, said, the internet interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. But it's not an automatic process. Threats continue to arise in the form of government actors and law enforcement, poorly written bills that would stifle expression and the flow of information on the web. And then there's the inconsistent and sometimes, sometimes downright terrible content moderation decisions by the giant social media platform one of which might be leading a bunch of new folks to try a federated world, we'll see. Protecting our freedom online will always be a work in progress, and we're thankful to every one of you for helping to move us forward. Um, of course, those are just three examples. Um, I wanted to share with you a little sizzle reel that we've just put together, uh, EFFers uh, in the news, um, because I thought you might enjoy taking a peek at it. The Electronic Frontier Foundation, also known as EFF, has privacy concerns. There are a lot of ways in which this could go very wrong very quickly. New and unexpected threats. We think that it's a serious invasion of our privacy and civil liberties. We're really concerned about the impacts um, to First Amendment rights. The targeting of Asian communities throughout Sacramento. La policía no deben tener el poder de accesar miles de uh, cámaras privadas para conducir vigilancia en tiempo real. We're concerned that there are risks to human rights and personal safety. Bad things are coming and we're very concerned about Yeah, Yeah, absolutely, because it's not like a normal medical record. Now that Roe versus Wade is overturned, law enforcement could use a woman's personal data to bring criminal charges if they suspect she's received an illegal abortion. Agnet searches on locations that provide abortions and then work backwards to figure out who the people are who went to a particular facility during a particular time frame. Our phones track us, Google tracks us. All of that data is collected and it's sitting somewhere. So what rights do Americans have? The federal level, there's an Electronic Communications Privacy Act called ECPA. There's the Stored Communications Act, which governs emails. There are some protections in place, but they are so out of date. They are decades old. They are not what we need for this moment by a long shot. The Electronic Frontier Foundation says any legislation to that effect will meet with resistance from Google and others. What are some actionable steps? We really need privacy law. Restrict location services on the apps that you're using, or you might just leave your phone off altogether. Now, there are things that companies can do. First, they can make sure that the warrant is, in fact, valid, because they're not always valid at all. Secondly, um, they can decide whether they might want to fight back if there's some legal grounds to do so. Another thing they can do is notify their users 
um, unless there's a gag order, which may have happened in this case. But really, the first thing they need to do is they need to help their users protect themselves. They need to adopt, for example, end-to-end -end encryption. If these companies aren't collecting this personally identifiable data that can be exploited, the problem is solved in all of these cases. Privacy should not be an opt-in model or something that users have to advocate for for themselves. It should just be on by default. Each one of us has the power to inspire others in our own ways. That is precisely why we are so proud to celebrate tonight's award winners. Together, we are the community that can and must create a better digital world than the one we have today, and I know we can do it. Thank you. So before we do present this evening's awards, I want to take a moment to honor two members of the EFF family that we lost to cancer this last year. Elliot Harmon and Peter Eckersley. Elliot and Peter were emblematic of the activism and public interest technology work that is so deeply important to the digital rights world, and they were both taken from us way too soon. And we are still mourning them. To share a few insights and memories of Peter and Elliot, please welcome EFF Activism Director Jenny Gebhardt and our tech, one of our technologist fellows, Jan Su. Elliot and Peter each affected more positive change in their 40-some years than most people could hope for in twice that time. However, none of these accomplishments were achieved in a vacuum. So tonight we recognize some of the amazing things that they brought to our community so that others might be inspired to pick up the torch. Elliot once wrote of the activism team's work and the events work, we win with words. And in the years since we've lost him, this mentor and boss and colleague and friend, those words are still really hard to find. Um, so for the next few minutes, I'm gonna pull myself together and I'll try to let Elliot's formidable accomplishments just speak for themselves. Um, first, I want to start with what I think was Elliot's deepest commitment in digital rights, and that was open access to knowledge and culture and scholarly research. He brought this value to everything he did. And one of the first times I got to work with him directly was on the Stand with Diego campaign. A Colombian student, Diego Gomez, was facing prosecution and jail time simply for sharing an academic article online, something that in this room of nerds is probably very relatable. <laughs> And Elliot's work on that campaign, it ensured that Diego's case became a flashpoint in the global movement for open access. And Elliot's work in EFX work ultimately contributed to Diego's successful acquittal. It was one of the first huge victories I was present for and got to work on in EFF, and it was such a thrill. Later, Elliot led EFF's activism strategy in our campaign against SESTA FOSTA. This required explaining tricky, and increasingly controversial legal issues around Section 230. This required building coalitions beyond the usual suspect digital rights groups. It required explaining the stakes to folks who might not have considered an acronym and some numbers important to them in their communities before. And throughout, Elliot masterfully distilled all of the jargon and all of the legal complexities into a clear value that all of us in this room can identify with how the internet enables the voices to have a voice, and the, chases, the choices that we have to make as a community to ensure that that value perseveres. And finally, in one of the last campaigns that Elliot ran for EFF, and perhaps my favorite thing I ever got to work with him on, Elliot coordinated EFF's largest ever advocacy effort and possibly the largest ever mobilization of the nonprofit sector in our save.org campaign. He rallied 871 nonprofits and tens of thousands of individual petition signers around our Save.org campaign. We had everybody from the Girls' House to Greenpeace like joining in to prevent a private equity firm from purchasing the .org domain. And I will never forget the thrill of like opening my laptop every morning 
and seeing dozens more campaign sign-ons roll in. And I will also never forget how quickly that thrill turned to dread. How are more people signing up for this? We didn't think this would be this big. Like, how are we gonna vet all these organizations? Can we fit all these logos on one web page? How is that gonna work? Is it just gonna scroll forever? Um, this was an all hands on deck moment for the activism team. I am seeing some faces in the audience who were there in the trenches with Elliot at that time. Um, and Elliot led us towards what was ultimately a victory with his signature compassion and determination and humor and humility. Elliot approached all of these campaigns not as fights for EFF to win. Um, he did have a habit of winning. But these were to him an opportunity to affect real people's lives through our work. And more than anything else, that is what I'm so grateful to carry with me from Elliot's example. Thanks. So first, let me say that in the true spirit of Peter Eckersley, I procrastinated writing the speech until the last possible minute. Um, and as a result, there were many moments in the course of writing it where I was about to text Peter asking for his thoughts. And it just felt so natural to ask him for advice, knowing that he would listen, think about the problem, and say something incredibly brilliant. Hurts to realize that he'll He's not even with us here tonight after all these years by our side. And that we'll never share his wisdom with us again, pending advances in preservation technology. Uh, when I started working at EFF a decade ago, Peter had already been here for years as the head of technology projects. But he soon became more than just my boss. He was a mentor to myself and many others, some of whom are among us tonight not just in technology, but in the finer details of how to have a rich and fulfilling life. Case in point, one cold, bright January morning in 2014, Peter and I were riding the Caltrain from Mozilla to San Francisco. A stranger sat down next to us and learned that we were working at EFF. And then his eyes lit up and he said, oh, that's so cool, but you guys defeated SOPA from IPA just a few years ago. So you've won, right? Uh, and Peter laughed, and he explained that it's, it's not quite like that. He, he said, imagine this. You are a hero in a comic book. And every time you defeat your nemesis, a new one appears. This has to happen. It must happen over and over again. And it has to work that way because you live inside the comic book. And indeed, if life is the cyberpunk comic book, Peter is a magical wizard who appears in our darkest hour and, with a twinkle in his eye, lights the path forward step by step. He was a visionary in the truest sense of the word because he saw what needed to be done to save the internet and he just started doing it. Let me give you just one example. In 2010, he noticed that Facebook, our favorite website, supported HTTPS, but it doesn't automatically upgrade to it. So he made these browser extensions with the help of some others called HTTPS Everywhere that automates the upgrade. And HTTPS back then was the exception rather than the rule because it cost money to get a TLS certificate. So he had this impossible vision. What if we partnered with a certificate authority and gave out free certificates that could be automatically deployed and renewed without any kind of zero user interaction? He thought this would change everything and finally get us to near 100% encryption on the internet. And he turned out to be spectacularly right in a time when few people believed this would work. So the project that became Let's Encrypt has now issued TLS certificates to over 300 million websites, and most sites now support HTTPS. We could spend hours here talking about the projects that he started in EFF, Privacy Badger, Panoff, with like SSL Observatory, and so forth. But suffice to say, it's undeniable he changed the face of the internet for the better. From the bottom of our hearts, we thank him for all he has done, and we'll do our best to carry his life forward. In, um, in closing, um, one thing
thing I'll remember so vividly about Elliot and Peter both is how they sounded, um, each filling the room with a distinctive voice and a booming laugh and a very deliberate way of stringing words together to tell a story and to invite an ally to join the fight. And the fights that Ellie and Peter won for the internet will continue to affect people's lives for the better. And the people who had the privilege of working with them, including so many of us here tonight, we also have the privilege of carrying forward the vision of the freer, more open, more secure, more vibrant internet that they knew was possible. Thank you all. Thank you, Jenny and Jan, for that uh, really wonderful tribute. Um, Peter and Elliot were, uh, you know, part of the EFF family, and so, you know, obviously that's, a, that's important to us. We really needed this moment to, you know, sort of to talk about them and reflect on them, uh, you know. But, you know, the two of them were also dedicated to the digital rights movement, and I think that's the thing that uh, I'll, I'll take away from this. So even if you didn't know them personally, I think you should know that our digital world is better off for having had them in it. And, uh, you know, wherever you guys are, thank you so much. Um, and it's also important to remember that, uh, you know, we don't do this work alone. Um, each of us can contribute to a future that uh, embraces creativity, diverse ideas, and the privacy to explore them on your own terms. Um, tonight's honorees exemplify that spirit of digital freedom in extraordinary ways. So, to present our first EFF Award of the evening, I'd like to introduce a longtime online rights activist who was a leader in EFF's international work for many years, served as Director of Strategy for EFF also, and is now an EFF Special Advisor. Please welcome Mr. Daniel Wright. So uh, now I'm no longer at EFF, I feel that I can reveal some of the secrets that run the organization. I see the lawyer, yeah. yes, okay. I thought you guys would support whistleblowing, okay. Um, so, uh, uh, the, the, the tricks and stories that you, you, you probably have reverse engineered from what we do, uh, and the first secret is uh, to always try and personalize the issue, personalize the, the story. Um, in many ways, what you're seeing here is, is, is an exercise in that, um, but of course there's another side to that, that all stories, all issues are made up of people, uh, people like um, Peter and Elliot and the other people that I can almost see out there, um, Dan and, and Aaron. Um, and most uh, of all, for, for, for this particular moment, uh, Allah. So uh, Allah was someone who has always been intricately connected not only to the issues but also to the institution of EFF. He was a big EFF supporter, um, and uh, many of us um, uh, count him uh, uh, as someone we've met and as, as a friend. Um, uh, okay, another big secret that I can reveal is that, um, and actually this isn't, this, this was something that I sort of reverse engineered myself in, over there as I was pacing around, as I was trying to explain a technique that, that we use at EFF, which is uh, particularly in the international space, which we notice that people can often see things in uh, uh, black and white in other places. We would often do this thing of pointing out an issue that was happening in another country, say China. We talk about the kind of level of surveillance that was going on in China and people, because China's a long way away and um, uh, you don't know much about China. So uh, people would see uh, that and go, oh my goodness, that kind of mass surveillance by a large state institution is appalling and a sign of authoritarianism. And then we would sort of pan the camera across to the United States or a little bit closer to the audience that we were talking to and pointed out the connections, the same tools of corporate and state surveillance. Um, and uh, like personification, like personalizing the story, that hit something else. Uh, which is, of course, those things were happening in those places. And even though uh, there's a capability to um, see, see some things better uh, in long distance, um, see things far away uh, in more detail in some ways and in clearer than uh, close up, 
Uh, again, something that we've used in the movement of time as well, where we point out a utopia and then, or a dystopia, and pan back to the present day. Um, those things are, are real in a lot of very strong ways. We are walking towards a dystopia, or we are walking to a utopia by making those individuals decisions right now. And those things are really happening in other places to people who are as real as, as you and I. Um, in Allah's case, what, what, what's interesting is that Allah had that ability, and still does, to see um, what was going on at short distance, too. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Allah was uh, a, a pivotal figure in the fight against um, uh, the Mubarak regime in what came to be called the Arab Spring. Um, he was a figure in Tahrir Square, and he was one of the engines that uh, connected those protests um, to the wider world through his constant uh, blogging, writing, and uh, uh, intercommunication. Um, what makes Allah not unique, but I think significant as an illustration of uh, the power of activism, um, if conscientiously and carefully uh, pursued, is that Allah went on from that point of view uh, and that moment uh, not to lead a government or um, to uh, participate uh, in the next stages, but to protest those as well. Um, there was a time when we used to joke that Allah um, was someone who had successfully been imprisoned by uh, not one um, uh, a dictator of Egypt, but two, um, and then three, and now four. Uh, he was one of the first people to protest after the um, Tahir uh, protest had uh, deposed uh, Mubarak uh, against um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the military uh, dictatorship that uh, followed that, um, following one of the worst massacres of Coptic Christians in that country that uh, followed that shift in power. Uh, uh, Allah was one of the first people to speak out uh, in public against that massacre and against um, the saviors of the revolution that he had originally uh, participated in. Uh, when they, in turn, were replaced by um, the uh, Isla Islamic Brotherhood, uh, Allah also protested them following a, a series of equally uh, terrible crackdowns on civil liberties and human rights in Egypt. And when, in turn, uh, that group was deposed and replaced by uh, a, a, another um, a junta, uh, Allah was on the front lines protesting the even more devastating arrests and tortures, uh, murders and imprisonments of what is now over 20,000 political prisoners. Uh, Allah, uh, has been in jail now on and off for most of the last decade. Uh, he is currently not only on hunger strike, he's been on hunger strike for 220 days, uh, he is now on water strike. Uh, he is uh, probably one of the leading figures in the campaign to free himself and all political prisoners in Egypt. Uh, in a few days, uh, President Biden will be meeting with the Egyptian government, and we are told we'll be lobbying hard for uh, Allah's freedom. Uh, my own uh, country, uh, that Allah is also a dual citizen of, is similarly uh, protesting his imprisonment. Um, one of the other secrets of, um, uh, of EFF is uh, how we choose these awards. Um, and we choose these awards very secretly. I'm not going to reveal the strange machinations and papal smoke that appears. But I will reveal one thing, which is we often talk about, is this, is this the moment? Um, and that's because many of award winners, past and present, uh, uh, appear every year. We always consider them. And so we always ask, is this, is this the time? Is this the moment uh, to pick this year to award the person who represents this issue. Um, I, I would love to say that this is Allah's year because he's free. Uh, it is Allah's year because he is not. He is in um, the dying moments of uh, a protest and uh, 
as his sister told the press this week. Um, really, this is the last hope for his freedom. Um, this, uh, look, this is a book that I happily recommend, um, and I'm just going to read from it. It's always terrifying when somebody comes and has like five green pieces on it. And so I want to just reassure you that I'm not going to read the entire chapter from this book. It will be relatively quick. But I wanted to read this particular part of it because Alain was an advocate not only for the freedom of the Egyptian people, but for all the technology and uh, systems that EFF um, uh, has fought for. And uh, he, he, he writes um, in a letter um, from prison in 2017, his, his part. It's called A Portrait of the Activist Outside His Prison. Um, we came of age with the Second Intifada. We took our first real steps out into the world as bombs fell on Baghdad. All around us fellow Arabs cried over our dead bodies. Northern Arabs chanted, not in our name. Southern comrades sang, another world is possible. We understood then that the world we'd inherited was dying and that we were not alone. We strove to understand company brochures, press releases from NGOs, official statements. It was never enough. We sought out our predecessors. We learned from them, taught them. For the most part, we refused their legacy, but respected their experiences. We understood that information technology was the key to shaping the new world and realized how exposed we were to global monopolies. So we adopted free and open source software as a condition for the development of society and achieving independence, and as a crucial tool in modernizing the economy and ending its subjugation. We started a campaign, touring the universities, student lecturing professors. We organized conferences and training programs. Technology localization became our top priority. We worked on the Arabization of terminology, of terminology, translated user interfaces. We designed fonts, developed software, and built websites. We connected bloggers across the Arab world and encouraged artists, writers, researchers, and translators to share access to their creative outputs and their archives. Working to support Arab online content, it wasn't long before we came up against censorship, prosecution, accusations of heresy, and the imprisonment of the word. So we joined ranks with the defenders of freedom of opinion, of expression and belief, of press freedom and academic freedom. We built online networks and political movements. We set up IT labs and technology clubs in Cairo's informal neighborhoods. We built wireless networks to extend the internet to Egypt's countryside. And then we were invited to share those experiences in sub-Saharan Africa. And so became engaged with networks that worked to establish online connectivity as economic, cultural, and social rights. We engaged with reality. We tried to change it, influence, to anticipate it, and shape it. We were, of course, one of the weaker parties present, but we were present. When the world noticed us and our story started to interest journalists and become materials for research centers, we insisted on our own narratives rather than those being imposed upon us. So we were not surprised by the revolution. We had sought it. And we were not surprised that it inspired protest movements in Europe and the US. Did we not protest together against the war on Iraq? Wasn't our work for change and reform linked to open debates, shared struggles and virtual communities that brought together comrades from every continent? But then we lost, and everything lost its meaning. That's not the note to end with Allah. Allah would frequently uh, quote in his tweets uh, the old um, Antonio Gramsci quotation, I believe Gramsci was quoting from someone else, uh, that we can have a pessimism of the intellect, but we need an optimism of the will. Uh, right now, Allah is surviving entirely on that optimism of his will. Um, and I'd urge all of you uh, after this to join with the Free Allah movement uh, and help um, support the freedom of uh, Egyptian political protesters, prisoners, and Allah, our friend. Um, one of the persons who was most close to Allah uh, during all of this time uh, is, is Gillian York, my, my colleague uh, at EFF. Um, Gillian couldn't be here, um, but she's, um, she's sent this message to you and to Allah. Hello, good evening to all of you, and congratulations to tonight's EFF award winners. I truly wish that I could be there with you this evening to celebrate. 
I'm thrilled that my good friend Ali Abdel Fattah is among tonight's EFF award winners, although I wish that it could be under different circumstances. As you know, Ali can't be with us here tonight because he is, remains in prison in Cairo where he has spent most of the past decade. Ali has been on hunger strike now for well over 200 days, and by the time this video airs, he will have ceased to intake any form of nutrition. We had hoped that in his absence, one of his family members could be with us here tonight to accept the award, but they are understandably fighting for his freedom and for his life. I first met Ale in 2008 at a meeting in Budapest and was struck by his outspokenness, his shining intellect, and the thoughtful way in which he pushed back against some of the research that was being presented there. He was critical, but not for the sake of being so. He genuinely hoped to make the world a better place. It is that spirit that the Egyptian government has fought so hard to crush. Ale is known globally for his activism and the role that he played in the Egyptian revolution, but he's so much more than that. He's a skilled technologist and the founder of one of Egypt's important early blog aggregators. He's a talented writer. I strongly recommend to everyone that you pick up a copy of his book, You Have Not Yet Been Defeated, which continues to inspire me. But he is most of all a brother, a father, and an incredibly good friend. Our friendship, like all of his relationships, has been marred by the years that the Egyptian government stole from us. But in the time that we have had together, Allah has taught me so much. Long before it was common, uh, he pushed me to use encryption. In our many conversations over OTR, off-the-record messaging, and stuck in Cairo traffic back in the day, he taught me how to view the complexities in our world, to see things differently than I might have otherwise. He taught me to be fearless and unabashed in my activism, to not be afraid to speak up and to do it with humor whenever possible. Ale deserves to be free and it is my hope that this award, which he richly deserves, will help to secure his freedom. To Ale with my everlasting solidarity, congratulations and may you soon be free. Thank you. So uh, I didn't want to end on uh, quite the, the, the note that, that perhaps this um, uh, could end on. Uh, Allah is alive and Allah will be free. Um, but I also wanted to make one final connection. Uh, the chronology that you heard from his book, which uh, I agree with Jillian, is an amazing book. And you should totally buy it. Um, uh, one of the things that comes out of that, that, that chronology is that Allah, Allah is 40 years old. Um, so he has a particular um, generational moment that I think rings true for, for many, many of us here. Um, but one of the things that's changing our experience from being pioneers to something a little more uh, long-term is that this is a possibly a fight that will take many generations. I just want to leave you with one more I promise you, it's short. No one has flashed the 30 seconds yet, so I'm going to take advantage of that. Um, to point to, thank you. <laughs> um, to point to what it means to create a generational movement. Um, Allah comes from a generation of activists who fought many years for um, freedom in Egypt and elsewhere. And uh, when his uh, father died, he, uh, he spoke at the funeral to what it meant to be uh, in a, a family of activists. Um, his father was uh, a lawyer. He would talk to us too about the history of the law and he would talk to us just kids, teenagers taking our first steps in protest movements. And it was important for him to talk to us, even if we weren't going to specialize in law, important that we understood how the law was developed and what the law could be like, what justice could be like. Most people who came in frequent contact with him, whether they were family or defendants, or activists on the street, or in student movements who invited him to talk at their events. They all developed a certain sensitivity and understanding of the constitution and the law that allowed them later to form groups, to assist lawyers, and to relieve them some of the burdens of their work and to engage with the processes of legislation. Uh, one of the other secrets of EFF is that it's not just the lawyers for the digital revolution, they're people who make connections and make friends uh, and change the world, uh, but also 
EFF inspires people to take careful aim at what they can change in the world and not to lose hope even in the darkest times. So uh, I'm very, very proud to hand this award from EFF to Allah when he's free. Thank you. hearts here are with Allah right now and uh, uh, wishing him well. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next presenter, who is an artist, activist, and member of the Hacking Hustling Collective. Um, please welcome EFF staff technologist, Daley Barnett. So I'm, I'm going to keep this brief. Uh, I'm here to introduce Digital Defense Fund. Uh, it's a great honor. Um, the Digital Defense Fund provides digital security advice for the abortion access movement. Um, but um, I'll let Kate Bertash, who is uh, going to accept the award on behalf of DDF, uh, to go into more detail about that work. But regardless, I am so glad <laughs> that we get to give DDF their flowers because it's, well, it's a bummer, uh, obviously, <laughs> that their work is so prescient right now. Um, but I guess maybe it's a testament to their intuition and their ability to recognize things that need to be done. So thank you. <laughs> and. Um, I guess a little bit more insight. I've, I've been working at EFF for about three years, a little more. Um, and if there's one thing that I've learned in that time, it's that we at EFF um, exist in a network, right? Uh, we rely on the insights and the efforts of others to do what we have to do. And DDF has honestly made our work easier. <laughs> Um, they've made our work better, and they've guided us in avoiding uh, would-be mistakes. So for that, I am very grateful. Thank you. Um, they make us better. And so the least we can do is to give them this award. So thank you, DDF. Thank you so much uh, from my team and from myself. Uh, I want to foremost also thank the abortion access organizations and activists that are out there right now on the ground doing the work. Uh, they are during sleepless nights, brutal financial scarcity, death threats, and expanding legal dangers to ensure that the hypothetical right to privacy enshrined by the right to an abortion is a promise kept. This award is for them. Uh, they honestly did teach us how to do this job, uh, helped us best how to understand these digital threats and how to collect, protect our collective rights. They are, and were, they are and have been and will remain to me and to the rest of my team, the guiding star for this work. Uh, I would love also to thank EFF and all the other collaborators and co-conspirators in peer movements. Uh, we owe it to all of our amazing colleagues who work in trans rights, in racial justice work, sex worker rights, and all those folks who made sure that we were in the room together a long time actually before we understood just how connected digital privacy rights and abortion rights really are. They are the reason that the very same night that the Dobbs decision came down, I received about a thousand signal chats uh, and calls reassuring us that we were not in this by ourselves. So with that community support, over the last five years we've worked with the abortion access movement to uh, work on our digital threat models, respond to all of these many legislative changes, to make mistakes together and learn to become the team that this community needed. Today we provide a comprehensive suite of completely free technical assistance services, including digital security evaluations, trainings, tech service provider referrals, project management, community-built software support, 
grants and managing movement-wide collaboration spaces for all of the above. I'm getting tongue-tied with you so many things. Um, so increasingly, with the encouragement of organizations like EFF, we are taking on also what I like to call tech platform accountability projects. Uh, so we ensure that we document what the movement is experiencing in trying to uh, engage and navigate tech companies' monopolies on patients' access to care. Uh, we then ensure that those experiences get back actually directly to the corporations who hold this control of the digital commons themselves. And we get an advocacy org just like y'all who help us do something about it. So already, unfortunately, the first few months after Roe has been overturned, we can see how necessary this collaborative work has been together. For the years before the fall of Roe, I don't know if you know this, I certainly didn't before getting this job, that Google searches and text messages have already been used as evidence in abortion prosecutions. And now companies like Meta continue to turn over DMs of users in order to help charge them with the crime of seeking an abortion. Many states are now also directly seeking to outlaw the sharing of abortion information online. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, one of the state AGs sent a subpoena to an abortion website for posting a billboard up in their state. And even where sharing abortion information remains hypothetically legal, tech companies have for years censored accurate abortion referral information off their platforms using a lot of the automated systems that were put in place after FOSTA-SESTA. They gladly instead take money from the highest bidder to instead panel anti-abortion medical misinformation and direct users into fake clinic honey traps that harvest and resell their information. We today find ourselves as abortion advocates in the struggle for the soul of what internet freedom means. And it's very real consequences for our freedoms in the physical world. It's through these experiences of abortion seekers and those who support them that we've affirmed the inextricable light rights, or the inextricable link between our bodily autonomy rights and our digital privacy rights. We've seen time and again that our adversaries will target and erode the rights of our digital bodies to criminalize and restrict the autonomy of our physical bodies. In this way, our digital rights are tied to all of our freedoms, online and offline, as Cindy had said, and the stakes become ever higher for a future of all of our work together. The only reason I am here right now accepting this award, representing an organization that is all, at all ready to deal with what we all are facing for the road ahead, is because five years ago, somebody took a really big chance on us. They gave us financial resources and an unbelievable amount of trust to figure out how best to address these problems. With that time and that money, we were not only able to fill in the technical and operational security gaps of this movement, we were able to build a community and a true sense of that community's belonging in digital space. We were able to affirm to the abortion access movement and all those it serves that the internet belongs to you too. Every day I meet people already doing the same digital rights work who also deserve that same opportunity, who deserve that same trust and resources and freedom to identify and address the specific digital civil liberty problems their movements experience. I want to see all of my peers who do digital security and internet freedom work for trans rights, sex worker rights, racial justice organizing, labor organizing, voting rights, immigration rights, and so many more spaces to receive the same support that we have been given to take on an unprecedented expansion of authoritarianism and the surveillance state. This work has never been more critical and never more a matter of life and death, as we heard, unfortunately, just a few moments ago, with threats that rattle the very foundations of our democracy and democracies abroad. We at DDF has also never been more ready to support and ensure the success of other new voices. We're eager to offer partnership, material support, and welcome collaborating technologists and experts to all of our initiatives, including our Techies for Reproductive Justice community, which actually did launch at the very same night. So you can check that out on our website. Um, as all of you, you, you ensured that we are not alone, we are actually also really, really eager to ensure that uh, we're doing the same for all of those who are going to join the work in the next few years and as we heard, generations to come. So in a time when so much of the work to alleviate suffering and protect human rights feels invisible, all of you as the EFF community have given us the gift of knowing we are seen. We are able to declare loudly that we will never comply in advance because you have our backs. And I hope you'll continue to work with us to ensure that there'll be more people standing where I'm standing right now because you saw them and helped back them up too. And in exchange, we will continue to do our part. We will ensure that this award is promised kept to all of us and our most fundamental human freedoms. For myself and my entire team, thank you so, so much.
Thank you so much, Jane and the Digital Defense Fund. Uh, never been a more important or weirder time to be doing the work that you do, so thank you so much for being here. Um, so I would like to introduce our third and final presenter of the evening. Um, she is a longtime consumer technology reporter. Um, she was a longtime consumer technology reporter at the Washington Post. You just got the journalist spirit in you still. Um, she is one of our resident experts on the mechanics of American state legislation. She is EFF senior legislative activist Haley Sukiyama. Please welcome. Her. Good evening. My name is Haley Sukiyama, and I am senior legislative activist at EFF. It's my honor tonight to introduce Kyle Means, EFF award winner for his right to repair advocacy. Kyle has become a leading evangelist in the U.S. and internationally for the right to repair, hammering home the important role that being able to fix, to tinker with, and to choose who you trust with your own devices plays in, make, uh, plays in making sure people control their data, their security, their stuff, and helps the planet in the process. Right to repair is having a moment this year with legislation percolating at, at the state and federal level. This past year, the movement has notched a series of successes after years and years of work that Kyle has been an instrumental part of. In Colorado, the legislature passed a law to allow wheelchair owners access to parts, software, and manuals needed to repair their wheelchairs. And with little, excuse, a little advocacy, there's a right to repair bill for electronic devices on the New York governor's desk right now that Kyle and the Repair Coalition shepherded through a difficult legislature. It's just one signature away from making history. That wouldn't have happened if Kyle hadn't recognized the importance of the right to repair years ago when he started a platform where people could share repair information. Since it was founded, yes, in a dorm room, iFixit has helped millions of people take charge of their own devices and then help others do the same. When advocating for change, it's hugely important to give people a tangible idea of how an issue affects them personally. And Kyle is a master at this because he knows exactly how every day people seek out information on how to fix their stuff and has worked to contribute this enormous consumer resource to the world. Kyle has also had a long relationship with EFF, having worked with the organization for about a decade. Right to repair implicates so many parts of EFF's work. Manufacturers claim a lot of repair information, such as manuals and even diagnostic codes, is copyrighted and try to use that copyright to force buyers to come back to them anytime they need to fix their stuff. And, even, and things are even worse with the proliferation of smart TVs, phones, cars, wheelchairs, and so on. The software that makes those things smart is usually locked up with digital rights management software. Breaking that DRM can be illegal all by itself, even if you're just trying to do something that's otherwise fine. That's part of what makes Kyle's work so important and a little bit risky, though I think should his work ever invite a lawsuit, I know some folks who are ready, waiting even for that day. I first connected with Kyle in my past life as a technology reporter, and archive search suggests we first spoke about the iPhone 5 and its proprietary screws in 2012. <laughs> Since then, it's been my privilege to move from interviewing Kyle to learning about how to do the work from him. In many ways, he's an ideal tech policy advocate. I've seen myself how he moves with astonishing ease between the technical and policy aspects of right to prepare issues. He's had countless meetings with legislators, staffers, parliamentarians, regulators, and others, helping them see the benefits of repair. At the same time, he never forgets the center of right to repair work, actual people. He excels at helping people tell their own stories and brings more people into the fold, such as farmers who are fed up with waiting on John Deere to come and fix their tractor when their crops are rotting in the fields because they can't harvest them. His work and leadership has helped build a community that includes the public interest research group, hacker groups, security researchers, and many others. Right to repair is up against some big enemies, but the perseverance of this movement is paying off. Now, Kyle would be the first to tell you that this is the result of a lot of teamwork. In fact, he wrote a lovely post on iFixit about receiving this award in which he was eager to spread, the, spread out the plaudits to those he works with in the Repair Coalition. That Kyle spent five paragraphs of a seven paragraph blog post calling out the contributions of others should tell you a lot about his personality, but also demonstrates why he's such a strong and effective leader within the repair community. So it is my privilege to make sure he gets at least some of the spotlight for himself tonight. Please join me now in applauding Kyle Weems and recognizing his work with the EFS Award. <laughs> Hey, this is pretty cool. <laughs> uh, 
I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I feel like very much this is one of those we stand on the shoulders of giants kind of thing. I remember I was in seventh grade uh, sitting in science class reading Slashdot, because that's what you do, uh, and reading a post EFF wrote about the passage of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and what a catastrophe Section 1201 was. <laughs> and I don't know if anyone in this room wrote that post. I, don't, uh, I have no idea who wrote that. I should go back to, to uh, Internet Archive and see. Um, uh, and I remember actually printing it out. I was so pissed off uh, of what it takes to piss off a seventh grader. Um, kind of knew all along that I would have some kind of, you know, uh, role in, in fighting for digital rights. Um, didn't exactly know what that would be. So, I, uh, you know, majored in computer science, went to Cal Poly and, and uh, was, knew that I wanted to develop the software tools to be able to have an impact on the world somehow, but I didn't know what. And like two months into this, I dropped my laptop on the power plug. And it was one of those things where if you sort of like stood on one foot and the moon was aligned correctly, I could get the power to charge. So it's like, okay, this is fine. I can take this apart and I can fix this myself. I certainly didn't have the money to buy a new laptop. Started pulling the thing apart and very quickly got stuck. And so I did what all of you would do. I just Googled, how do I fix this? Where's the service manual? And I knew that the service manual existed because I had seen it at the Apple repair shops, but I couldn't find it. And I, I don't know about, about you, but my perspective is if information isn't on the internet, it doesn't exist. <laughs> so this is this is a cognitive dissonance. This was very frustrating. So I muddled my way through the repair and then did some more research and found out that sure enough, it had been on the internet and someone has sent a DMCA takedown request. Uh, and so this is where Corinne gets very excited because this was the entry of Kyle into the world of copyright. <laughs> so fantastic. So. Um, the, the easy way to get around Apple's copyright on this was just to write my own. So we took it apart, again, uh, took, uh, took pictures along the way, put the manual online, and you think about what, of all the things in the world, how exciting is a repair manual? It's generally not the thing that you're, you're up late at night excited, oh, I'm gonna go read the repair manual. Uh, the, we got like 30,000 hits the first day, all the Mac websites picked it up, and sort of the rest is history. We became, well, we systematically took apart every product that Apple had, wrote repair manuals, put them online. And Apple was really the first company in history, I think, that had free open source service manuals online for every product that they made. Uh, but it was because we did it for them. <laughs> or I think if you're probably Apple's perspective, we did it to them. <laughs> and uh, probably a lot of Mac users around the world have taken advantage of that. Right now we help about 8 million people a month learn how to fix things, which is really cool. But where do you go from there? We, we expanded, we kept writing manuals for more and more things, um, but the question is like, what, what is kind of the impact? Where, where does this lead the world? And what, where does repair fit into this broader scope of, of software freedom, of hardware autonomy, of access to be able to tinker with and, and fully understand our things? Because I, 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 for me, fighting for the right to repair is not purely about, can I fix the thing that I have? Can I get myself out of the pickle that I'm in? But it's about what does the world of technology look like? What do we want the shape of the technosphere to be? Do we want to have access to all the way to the lowest levels, to the top level, to really understand and be able to have control of the things in our lives? Uh, and the fact that we can't fix our things is sort of like the first challenge of a submerged iceberg of the way that, that, that freedom has been taken away from us by the technology that was supposed to free us. So diving into this farther, we realized, well, let's open up, let's see if we can make an open repair manual for everything. So we, we made a wiki, we brought the community on board, we had thousands of people from around the world contributing. Now I fix it's up to uh, uh, 80,000 repair guides for about 30,000 devices. Um, but we realized very quickly that it was not possible for the community to keep up with the pace that the manufacturers are operating at. And I think that that is sort of the same tragedy that we have in the open source software world, that I don't care how fast all of us open source software hackers type, we can't type as fast as everyone who's being paid to write software. And so the amount of like closed software in the world is kind of dwarfing the amount of free software in the world, which is a sad thing. So how can we work to open up the hardware that is being created by people who are paid to create closed ecosystems? We have to change the rules of the game. And it was around 2010, 2011 that I realized that we were gonna have to fundamentally shift the, the laws, the rules of the game that all of these companies were playing in because the default was systems are locked down, farmers can't fix their things, college kids can't fix their laptops, and, and if, the introduction of computer chips into ordinary things 
was the wedge that they were using to lock down repairs, uh, repairs are just going to be the beginning and all of the rest of our freedom of what we could do with our hardware was going to be next. Uh, so they said, how can we put a, so, uh, stop this now? How can, how can we start, how can we stop the beginning of the end of, of autonomy of all of our things? So that was around the time that the U.S. Copyright Office did something kind of stupid. <laughs> and they decided, uh, AT&T and TrackPhone had gone to them and said, hey, you know those phones that people are unlocking because you gave them an exemption to be able to unlock phones? Yeah, that's hurting our ability to make money selling prepaid phones at 7-Eleven. Would you please stop? And the Copyright Office was like, yeah, okay, sure. And so the U.S. became the only country in the world, as far as I know, where it was illegal to unlock a cell phone and move it from one cell phone carrier to another. And so a lot of folks, uh, I think spearheaded by EFF, got, got engaged and got involved. And there was a White House petition, and I jumped on board. And we got the, I believe it was the second most signatures of any uh, petition, We the People petition, that President Obama ran. The first, by the way, the, the most popular petition was to deport Justin Bieber back to Canada. <laughs> which I think we can all agree would be a good idea. Also a good idea, maybe, maybe if we can unlock our phones. So President Obama said, sure, and then, and then I, uh, we banded together with Sina Conifar and a whole bunch of folks here and, and went to Congress and spent about a year fighting this. And I figured before we like, tackled the big right to repair fight, let's fight something easy that everyone can agree with everyone has phones. So we picked a more mainstream issue than right to repair. We won, Obama signed the bill, and cell phone unlocking is legal. Uh, and the Copyright Office has agreed with us ever since that unlocking phones is a good thing. Yeah. So since then, every three years, we go back to the Copyright Office and we ask for a little bit more. And, uh, and so one year, uh, I, I was chatting with some folks, and we said, well, what if we apply on behalf of farmers? Wouldn't it be nice if farmers could jailbreak their tractors or, or do repairs on their tractors? And, uh, and so, so we did this. We got a bunch of farmers. We actually went to Santa Maria, California, interviewed a whole bunch of farmers in Spanish, and we recorded, uh, we recorded uh, the Spanish interviews of them talking about how they couldn't fix the computers and the tractors. And then we sent the copyright office videos of farmers in Spanish in California talking about how they couldn't fix their tractors. It was super cool. Uh, we also, the, the copyright office had this petition form that was uh, incredibly baroque and opaque that was the public submission form. And it was like, you know, submit all these different fields. And one of them was select the class that you want to comment on. It was like class 1 through 27. No human was going to be able to figure out this form. So we said, that's fine, we're, we're technology people, we'll make our own form. And so we set up a different form on our own website, we collected, and we got 60,000 signatures or something like that. We got people to write individual notes, and then we needed a way to submit it to the Copyright Office, so we just wrote a script that went to the Copyright Office website and you know, one by one submitted the forms. <laughs> so we got a call from the Copyright Office, <laughs> and they said, please stop your script. What we didn't know is that this form was actually a Perl script that took the, the contents of the form submission, stuffed it into a Word document, attached it to an email, and emailed it to the Copyright Office. We took down the Library of Congress's email server. <laughs> so like, please stop DOSing us. You can just give us an Excel file. We're like, sure, here you go. Uh, <laughs> so th these are the things that you learn along the, along the way of, of digital activism. So we have successfully, uh, within the Copyright Office's framework, we've managed to expand significantly. Every three years, we ask for more repair rights. This last go-round, we got rights to repair just about everything. There's, there's a few things that we, that we don't have yet, but we got a lot. The catch is you have to whittle your own tool to fix the thing. I can't sell you the tool. Nobody can sell you the tool. You can't go on, on eBay and buy the tool. You have to whittle your own tool. So we're working on a federal bill to fix that. We are also at the, at the state level working on, on legislation that says, hey, if you're going to sell a complex electronics product, you have to make parts, tools, and information available. And that battle, we've been waging that battle for 10 years. We've had bills introduced in 44 different states. This year, over 25 states, including California, introduced bills. Uh, and we lost in 22 of those states. Uh, but we won in Colorado, uh, our first one ever. And we are so close in New York, it's ridiculous. We managed to pass almost unanimously New York Senate and the House, despite having $10 trillion of market cap registered to lobby against our bill. 
And this is the fear, and this is why this is so important that we capture this moment is, is I am afraid, like what happens when there's a hundred trillion dollars in market cap on the other side? Like how much money is so much that we will never have these freedoms again? If we don't capture this moment in time, if we don't get this done now, we will run out of this opportunity and we will, we will be trapped in a world where, where we have manufactured control, where none of us have autonomy over our devices. So that's right. I am uh, incredibly honored and appreciative. We are so close. Governor Hochul could sign this tomorrow and we could have the first worldwide uh, right to repair vote. We are, we are so close um, and absolutely couldn't have done it without all of you in our incredible community. So very, very grateful. Thank you very much. This is an absolute honor. Congratulations uh, to all of our honorees tonight, Ala, DDF, Kyle. Um, you know, I love how diverse yet important all three of our honorees are this year. I think it's really, really cool. Everyone is doing something that is so deeply important and touching to um, digital rights for people around the world. And they're all so different. I just think that's awesome. Thank you so Thank you guys so much. Um, So all of you really, again, you're an inspiration in the fight for a brighter future, especially in times of darkness. And uh, you know that's a responsibility that all of us share. Um, it's wonderful seeing all of you setting the stage for the next generation of digital rights supporters in the world. And um, you know this community thanks you. Thank you so much. Let's give, give another round of applause. Just. So now before we go tonight, um, I also want to one more time thank our event sponsors, Dropbox, Electric Capital, No Starch Press, Ritter, Costa, and Johnston, LLP, and Ron Reed, of course. Um, thanks to BFF members who support our work and make all of this possible. Um, I invite you to support the cause. You can do that by going to EFF.org slash join and signing up. Um, and for those in the room, I invite you to stay for refreshments and catch up with some of the dynamic technologists, activists, lawyers, and just a bunch of cool people in the room. Um, please stick around. And for those of you joining through cyberspace, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Good night.